Well, let's open with prayer. Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to gather as one body, to get into your word together, and to be reminded and even to learn more about who you are, what you do for us, what you require of us, which is the most exciting of all because all you really want is our love. The more we love you, the more we want to serve you. The more we love you, the more we want to please you. The more we love you, the more we want to be with you. We love your presence. We ask, Father, that you would come this morning. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this house. We are a people who long to see your glory. We long to establish your kingdom in this house and in our living area. And we want to represent you well so that when people see us, they see you. When they hear us, they hear your heart for them. So I ask that you'd help me to communicate what you put on my heart and that you'd help us to fall more passionately in love with you so that when we get up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord, we put a smile on your face because you know the day that you have planned for us, we, you and I, will walk it together. Thank you in Jesus' name. Well, the Lord has been talking to me a lot over the past few months about walking in the spirit of the living God. And... Um, that sounds so wonderful and exciting, but in my life, and it is, so don't, I'm not saying it's not, it is, but it doesn't always look like that in my life. <laughs> in my life, it looks like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot about you. Oh, that didn't come out right. Oh, God, that was wrong. And it's this constant walk. So it sounds depressing and awful, and it's not. Because when I see it, then God helps me to adjust so I become more like him. And that's what I want. I want to become more like him. And I can say that boldly because I know everybody here wants to become more like him. That's our cry. And something that Lord has been showing me is through this season of adjusting, I feel like a toddler. I don't know if I'm being too, too gracious to myself. Perhaps I'm maybe not really walking like I think I am. But you know how you follow the toddler? No, no. No, no. Yeah, come on. Oh, you're doing good. You're doing No, come on. Oh, good. Yeah, no, 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 no. Come on, come on. This way, honey. This way, this way, this way. This is what my walk has been like the past months as the Lord is showing me to trust him and just walk with him. And it's not, you're messing up, you're always needing forgiveness, you're always forgetting me, you're always having attitudes, you're always, 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 always. It's not the Father. That is not the Father. The Father is, no, 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 this way. No, 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 this way. Because he wants us to be safe, and he wants us to be strong, and he wants us to know him, and he wants us to be with him. And we say, Lord, we want to be with you. We want your presence. He says, I'm here. But you're over there. <laughs> Come on, let's go back over here where I am. And so, as I was talking to the Lord one day about this, because it is a really adventurous walk with the Lord, because we're always getting close to the cliff and he grabs us before we step off, like you do a toddler who wants to walk around. Nobody in their right mind brings a toddler to the heights of the um, Grand Canyon and says, oh, go explore, honey. <laughs> you follow them like this, you hold on to them, you carry them, you put those little doggy 
things on them with the leash, whatever you gotta do to make them safe. Because you know that they, they go places they shouldn't go and they would do things they shouldn't do. And because you love them so much, you rear them back in again. And that is the heart of the father. So one day I was talking to him and I said something and he said to me, you don't know whose spirit you're walking in. And it caught me, I'm like, oh, I guess I don't, because I just did. <laughs> Help me, Lord, to understand your heart. I want to walk in your spirit, not mine. I don't want to walk in demonic spirits. I don't want to walk in anything that doesn't represent you. And so this is what God's been doing with me, and this is what I feel like I'm supposed to talk about. There is never any condemnation in Christ Jesus. There is never any judgment that is unjust or not right, but only a clarity to his children so we know how to adjust to his heart and get out of our own. So I'm going to start with, I don't have the scriptures in my, I have the, the word in my phone, I have the scriptures in my book, and I want to tell you where I'm finding them so that if you want to find them sometime again, you can. All right, so in Isaiah 11, 2, it talks about the seven spirits of God. These are the spirits that we want to walk in. The spirit, this is in the, the oops, sorry. This is the Living Translation, and most of what I'm going to share today is from the Living. It's been my new Bible I've been reading in. I love the Amplified. It's my rock and foundation, but I'm stepping into another category of the Living Translation, or the Passion Translation, and I'm really liking it. So the spirit of extraordinary wisdom, the spirit of perfect understanding, the spirit of wise strategy, the spirit of mighty power, the spirit of revelation, and the spirit of the fear of Yahweh. Those are the seven spirits of God. Wisdom, understanding, wis um, strategies, power, Revelation, which is what we are always crying out for, to know him more, he has to unveil to us himself, and then we go, whoa, ooh, oh, oh, oh. We just, like all the emotions that we have because we see his, his awesomeness and his might and his love and his heart and his holiness and his power and his compassion and his grace. And it's like there's so many parts of him. He will find his delight in living by the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Whoever can find it will find delight in walking in the spirit of the Lord and living in it. Okay, now this is also talking about who Jesus is. And I don't know if you realize this, but the word Christian just means you represent Christ, or you're a little Jesus walking around. So you should look like him, talk like him, reach out like he did, love like he did. And so thus, we need to grow in these things. And these are the, these are the spirits of God that we want in us. And then, the fifth verse, and I really like this. This is part of Jesus, or what we can have. Righteousness will be his warrior's sash, and faithfulness his belt. So they have these little icons, and so I pulled up the icon, and the first thing it says is, that means fairness and truth will be his clothing. So if I'm wearing Christ, fairness and truth will be seen in me. Because the first, I mean, you don't always like 
the first thing you see person, you don't go, let me look at your clothes. But what you're wearing is going gonna, is gonna to make a difference. And I, I know guys don't do this stuff, but us women, we've heard about the color coding, you know. Oh, don't wear that color, honey. It makes you look like you died three days ago and nobody told you. <laughs> oh, that looks so nice on you. You need more of that color. Because the color we wear causes our complexion to change. So when I am wearing Jesus, my complexion should change. I should look different than just the world who's heavy burdened and discouraged or worried or fearful or wondering what's coming next and not sure how you're going to do it and all the things that the world struggles with. But when they see us, they should see the countenance of Jesus, full of grace and truth, filled with joy, loving and grace and compassion. That's our clothing. Like, wow, that's so cool. I really like that. So then, if we go to Luke 9.55, we're going to hear another story, some more scripture that gives us another picture. Um, when Jesus was walking with his disciples, and because the Samaritans were rejecting them and not letting them hang around and just, just being rude. I mean, seriously. Are you kidding me? You really going to say that to me? This is what they were feeling. And so they got this word of wisdom that said, Lord, if you want us to, we, you, if you wanted to, you could command fire to fall down from heaven, just like Elijah, destroy them all. After all, isn't that what we do to people who are rude to us? And Jesus rebuked them sharply, and he said, don't you realize, and I love this, this, this words are so good. Don't you realize what spews from your heart when you say that? It doesn't spew from your mouth. It spews from your heart. The Son of Man did not come to destroy our lives, but to bring life to earth. So when we open our mouth, we want life to come out, not death. Not destruction, not destroying someone's character, not destroying their hopes and their dreams, not helping them to understand what's real. You know, they need to know what's real. Let me tell you what's real. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus brought life everywhere he went. That is the right spirit. They were in the wrong. We're talking about the great apostles. They raised the sick. They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They raised up the sick. Rise up and walk. <laughs> it's scriptural. <laughs> but we forget, because we get caught up in us, we forget sometimes how we are representing Jesus. So when you think about what's in your heart, what do you feel? What do you see? What comes out your mouth? God's been teaching me for years how to listen to my mouth. I listen to my mouth a lot more than I ever did before because I hear what comes out of it. I know I need to make an adjustment or that God has already done the adjustment by what comes out my mouth. And I'm learning to hear what I say so that when I am talking, and I've done this so many times, I'm hoping I'm getting better at it, in that I start out, blah, 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 I'm talking away, and all of a sudden I hear it, and I start adjusting what I'm saying. But you know, <laughs> and really, but God's heart is, and so that's why I shouldn't be saying what I'm saying right now. And I have to flip it, because I don't want what comes out my mouth to not represent God, but it does give me an opportunity to see what's in my heart. And I don't always know what's in there, because according to Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful. Who really understands it? Who knows it? I have it in here. I just went out of order because that's what I do sometimes. Because my order is really makes sense to my brain. <laughs> but not always everybody else's, sorry. <laughs> okay. So after Jesus rebuked them, I 
thought about that, and I started thinking about what kind of spirits are out there. You know, that we hear about the seven spirits of God, and we hear about the character of God, that he is who he is, not just his character, but who he is. He is love. He is slow to patient. He is faithful. He is long-suffering. He is. He doesn't have those characters. That's just who he is. That's his, that's his being. So if he's got these wonderful traits, then where are all the awful traits coming from? They come from our old dad, because the Lord says in his word that you have two people you can serve, and one is God the Father or God, uh, the wannabe God, Satan, the forever loser. So if we have the character traits of our old father, who is Satan, or do we walk in the character traits of God, our Father, that now, now that we're his children? And so sometimes our nature wants to go back to the old stuff because we're being redeemed and saved day by day, going from glory to glory, going from learning to learning and loving to loving. So sometimes the spirits that are out there, we recognize them because they are our past, because we see it in other people, and because sometimes they still want to pop out our mouth. Spirits like anger, resentment. You know, there's a spirit of lying. There's a perverse spirit. There are rebellious spirits. There is a spirit of religion. Those are all counterfeit spirits. They're the wicked ones, and we don't want those in us. So when, when you're walking, you always want to be asking the Lord, okay, God, I want to be in your spirit. If I recognize anything that's not God, then I know it's not the right spirit. We can choose how we act, and that's what we do. We really choose. Well, he stepped on my toe, and I choose to get angry. Oh, he stepped on my toe. I'm sure he didn't mean it. We choose. And the choice we make is going to make us more like Jesus, or it's going to make us more like what we want to be, which becomes very selfish. And so... God wants us to keep that in our mind. We're not to be judging everything we say and everything we do. Oh, what spirit's that? What spirit's that? It, that's not what I'm saying, so please don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is there are spirits of God and there are spirits of the enemy, and we have to choose who we are going to serve this day. So in Samuel 15:23. And I've got it all mixed up. Well, I'll just quote it. This, uh, it says that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. And um, that's probably why I shouldn't quote it, because I forgot the other one. And what is like rebellion? Does anybody know? Off the top of your head? Is a sin. Rebellion's a sin of witchcraft and something divination. I can't think of. What's the rest of it? Or is that the second half? Well, that, that was the second half. Okay. Oh. Yes. So when we are choosing, what happened was King Saul wanted to have it his own way. He feared the people, and he wanted to be a people pleaser. So he chose to do what God told him not to do, which was to take from the battle that they just won because God gave them victory, and they chose, he decided he was going to hang on to the king. He was going to bring some of the sheep and stuff along, and he wanted some of the treasures. So when Prophet Samuel came to him and said, what'd you do? He said, what do you mean what I do? We won the battle. Look what I did. Look what I did. 
I, I saved some sheep because they were really nice and we can offer them to Jesus. Oh my goodness. God will be so pleased with the sacrifice because they're lovely, they're perfect. It's like, okay, so whose opinion are you walking in now? Is this yours or is this God's? When we choose our own opinion, our own way, our own thoughts, we're not choosing God. It's called rebellion, and rebellion is witchcraft. What happened in the garden? In the garden, Adam and Eve were told that God was withholding from them, and they, and they should just be more like him. Don't you want to be more like God? So to be more like God, who they already were like, you do this my way. You do it this other way. Don't you want to eat that fruit? Well, yeah, I want to eat the fruit, but I'm not allowed. Oh, well, why don't you want to eat the fruit? Well, it is lovely to look at. So they've checked it out. But why would God withhold anything from you? We start to consider our benefit, and why would, why would God do that to me? Why would that person feel like that? Why should I have to do it this way when this way is the same? Why do I have to say this to God when I can say this to God? Why do I have to worship together in a church when I can do it at home when we're watching TV? Why, 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 why? When you say why, that's the beginning of rebellion. It's not. It's the temptation to go there. So we have to be careful because that is, that's what they did. In the garden, that's what they did. They chose their way over God's way, which was witchcraft. It was birthed in the garden. So we do tend to want to do it that way because we were born into sin, but we're now a new creation. And that's what God wants us to remember. The old is gone. We don't, we don't have to do that anymore. It's gone. We're a new creation. Now my father is God. And that's why it's so sad to me when I choose to go backward a bit instead of going forward so I can keep going. And those are the things that help me to see where God's taking me and how mature I am. Does, does it, is it a thing to look and go, okay, how mature am I? But the word tells us in Hebrews 5, we know how mature we are because our maturity comes from us practicing the choices we make, whether to good or to evil. So am I making a better choice, which is God's, or am I doing my choice, which is me? So in our life, I don't know. I bounce all over the place. So this is me, which makes my life very complicated if I try to figure it out in my own brain. So don't ever try because it'll make you nuts. I don't even get it. I just am who I am, and I'm learning to be who I am. And you all can catch up whenever you have to. <laughs> That's not mine. But what I'm saying is, this is what I am saying. When we walk in our own way, we are walking in rebellion. As we mature in the Lord, we have, it's easier to choose. A child doesn't know how to choose. A toddler doesn't even think. They just wander. But as we mature, we put away our childish things. That's what we're told in 1 Corinthians 13. As we mature, we make different choices. And so... I want to encourage you because we are an amazing group of people. We're a handful. We're just a little bitty church. But God calls us Gideon's army. He didn't want 10,000 because then they go, look what we did. When you got a handful of Gideon men and women, you go, whoa, look what God did. We're just this. We only could give this, and he did this. That is why walking with Jesus is an adventure and why we want his presence and why we want his glory and why we want his kingdom. Because the more we have it, the more we get, the more he does. Because he's a God of multiplication. I give one, I get back 10. I give 10, I get back 100. We give this much, he makes it go this far. And that's what we want. And sometimes, I think, as a church, we get frustrated and discouraged. And God doesn't want us frustrated, and he doesn't want us discouraged. He doesn't ever want us to despise the little things. But he does want us to watch out for the 
little fox that will spoil your vine. And so that's why I sound like I'm talking here and I'm talking there, but they all go together. Because I want all God has, I want him to multiply it because I can only have so much, but he multiplies it. I want his kingdom. I want heaven. I want, to, I want what's in heaven here on earth. We can have it because Jesus said, this is how you pray. Come, kingdom of God, be done your will. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth. So we call in heaven. What's in heaven? Sickness? No. Poverty? No. Offense? No. Unforgiveness? No. Heaven. We have the authority and the right and the privilege as children of the Most High God to bring heaven to earth. But we don't get it because we get stuck wandering because we wander and we wonder and we judge by our seeing. But God says, don't judge by what you see and by what you hear. Judge by what I see, by what I say. Not by what they say, he say, she say. Not what news say. Not what neighbors say. But what I say. And sometimes I see things because I hate, and I can say this, I hate the spirit of religion. I hate it because I have found that my foot often gets stuck in it. And I go to walk and God goes, "Uh uh-uh, deal. But that's what you say, "Uh uh-uh. You got the wrong spirit. Oh, that's works. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that, God. Thank you for showing me. Oh, freedom again. That's how we walk with the Lord. And that's why we want to walk in his spirit. Because we're going places. Because we got people to see and things to do for the kingdom of God. And the more we can carry the kingdom of God, the more we can carry the glory of God, the more we, we bring the presence of God, the more we see healing, the more we see restoration, the more we see reconciliation, the more we see freedom, the more we see healings and, and miracles and provision, not just for us, but for the people that he sends us to. And I don't know about you, but somebody might be really, really sick, and you've been praying and praying and praying, and God says, go pray again. Go, are you kidding me? Obviously, I don't have the gift of healing because I've done it 493 times, and they're still sick. Now, whose spirit is that? Is that the spirit of God who tells me, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking? Or is that the spirit of me or man or the enemy that gives doubt, fear, hopelessness, and lack of faith. There is something that we get caught into and we blame God. We blame ourselves. We blame our past. We blame our husband. We blame our wife. We blame our kids. We blame our job. We blame the government. Because everybody knows, just like Adam and Eve knew, that the reason that sin came into the world was because Adam clearly said it was his wife's fault that God gave him, so he was blaming God. Eve clearly spoke, it was a serpent you created, which means she was clearly blaming God. The serpent was silent because he knew God. All creation knows God. We now do this. I couldn't help it. I was so angry, but it's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my child. Oh, that child of mine. Oh, my gosh. Only mercy of God's going to get that child anywhere. My stupid boss. I know you're not supposed to say stupid, but he's really stupid. <laughs> this is what we do, and then we wonder why we're not carrying heaven around. And God said, my people love me, and they want me, and they want my kingdom, but they, they forget that sometimes they get so caught in religion 
that is done by works, which is man making his own way, which is a form of witchcraft. And I can't bless witchcraft. But I do forgive you. I set you free. I fill you again. I give you a right spirit. Then you call down heaven, and people start getting healed, and they get delivered. And what's amazing is I thought about this with the Lord. He started saying to me, he says, okay, who's one of you are like heroes of the faith? Well, David. I mean, who doesn't love David? David was a warrior. David was a worshiper. David was gracious. David was faithful. David, David, David. David was a man after God's own heart. I mean, how does it get any better than that? But David didn't always walk in the right spirit. It didn't make him not a man after God's own heart. It hurt him. It stumbled him. It affected a whole nation. But it didn't make God love him less, and it didn't mean he wasn't redeemable. And I think when we walk, we get stuck in something, and then we beat ourselves up because we know better. We think God now can't move because I didn't. I remember a friend of mine, oh, man, she could carry the presence. I mean, I just like to stand by her because God oozed out of her. But when you got together... To worship and pray. If she didn't have her morning devotion, she was rendered useless. Why? Well, I can't pray for that person. I, I, I can't get a prophetic word. I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I, I didn't have my time with God. That's religion. God doesn't say, when you spend 10 hours a week with me, I will release with you the ability to heal a cold. But if you spend 20 hours with me, you can heal cancer. Just think what you can do if you give me the whole week. Man, people are going to be raised from the dead. That's not what God says. But we forget because we get stuck in a spirit of religion, and there is a spirit of religion. And when you're in that atmosphere, your faith goes down, condemnation rises, and you are rendered useless. And God said, the day is coming, and not so far away, when this church is going to start bursting at the seams. But I want the foundation solid. I don't want my children forgetting it's not what they do that makes me work. It's who I am in them. And if they can walk in me, there is no thing I will not do for them. When you abide in the vine, and I abide in you, ask what you will. Not ask what you need. Ask what you will, and you will have it. Why? Because when we're grounded in Jesus, we're not going to ask stupid. Because we love him, and we want his heart. And his heart's in us, and then we get the desires of our heart, which is not a bad thing. Because why would God say, I will give you the desires of your heart, and then go, ah, psych. That's not God. And so God wants to encourage us all to keep going forward in his spirit. If you get stuck in stupidity, say, that was stupid. I'm sorry. Please wash me with your blood. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. Father, forgive me. He goes, okay. He doesn't go, well, all right, I'll give you two more chances. But, you know, you're running out of time because I've already given you 29. He goes, okay. That's our God. So, if you find you're walking in the wrong spirit, don't get angry, don't get frustrated, and don't get discouraged. Just repent and go on. It takes how long? Two minutes? Well, if you're wordy, it takes two minutes. <laughs> if you're a, a man or woman, a few words, it takes 30 seconds. Father, I was wrong. Please forgive me. And then you keep going. And then you go far. Because you're not doing this all the time. 
Oh, thank you, Lord. I was getting dizzy. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lord. I'm getting dizzy. That's not as hard for us. Okay, so how do you know what's in your heart? Oh, wait. I wanted to go to Numbers 14, 22. I'm stuck on another one. Sorry. All right, so God was talking to, I don't know who he was talking to. I don't know if he was talking to Joshua or if he was talking to Moses, but this is, I think it was Joshua. It's numbers, he was talking to Moses, sorry. So God was talking to Moses, and he said, surely all the men who have seen my glory and my miraculous signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet they have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice. Who? They saw. They experienced. But they still didn't give God their heart. He said, by no means will they see the land that I swore to give their fathers, nor will any who treated me disrespectfully and rejected me will see it. He wasn't talking about them acting, you know, saying, I don't want you to be my God. No, they just wanted to do their own thing. And if they weren't fed, they would grumble. And if they didn't get their drink, they would grumble. And if they saw the giants, they would grumble. And all they wanted to do was go back and eat. And I, who can blame them? Leeks and garlic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo. We don't need the grapes from the land that we're going into that are as big that it takes two men to carry a bunch. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. No, I want to go back. I enjoyed my slavery. Every time that whip hit my back, it made me shout, Woo, glory. <laughs> I was really, really excited the day that Pharaoh decided that I could go buy, get my own straw and still make the same amount of bricks. Woohoo! And I got to eat leeks, garlic, and onions. We sometimes are so foolish in our thinking, we forget who our daddy is. And so because of that, God said, look, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, but I'm done. They're not going over there and spreading this garbage. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, has followed me fully. I will bring into the land, bring him into the land, which, and his descendants shall take possession of it. I want to possess what is mine by God. Everything I am allowed, every part of my destiny, everything I'm allowed to do for the kingdom of God, I want it all. But I also want my children to possess theirs. It's a generational blessing when we rock with the right spirit. So when you're looking at yourself, and we should, we should stop and say, okay, God, is there anything in me that I'm missing? Show me. Oh, I hear myself saying that. Hmm. I found myself thinking about that. Hmm. Adjust, keep going. When we do that, we are going to see the kingdom of God come in a magnificent way. Now Luke 6, 44 and 45. says, you'll never find choice fruit hanging on a bad, unhealthy tree. Every tree will be revealed by the quality of fruit it produces. 
and you will never pick figs or grapes from a thorn tree. People are known in the same way. Out of the virtue stored in their hearts, good and upright people will produce good fruit. Likewise, out of the evil hidden in their hearts, evil ones will produce what is evil. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and heard in your words. I'm like, wow. This is why we have to listen to what we say, especially when we get sucker punched by the enemy. You ever have a sucker punch? Everything's fine and dandy. You get an emergency call and so-and-so was in an accident or so-and-so had a heart attack or so-and-so just found out they're going to have three months to live, according to the doctor, or so-and-so. We get this, like, unexpected boom. What comes out of us in those booms, we want to be good fruit. We want to show faith. We want to show uh, that we trust our God in every circumstance. And so those are the times to me that are like in your face moments and we stop and we consider and sometimes we're so caught off guard we just kind of regroup. Those often don't throw us as much as the everyday, oh my gosh, I was talking to this person on the phone and did you hear what they said to me? I mean, how rude. I went into the restaurant and they said, what do you want? I'm sorry, I thought I was coming to be served here. Oh, can you believe they did that? Do you know how long my waitress took to finally get me my food? And then it still wasn't right. Those are the times that we get caught up because we're just living life and nothing is really ruffling our feathers much. And those are the times that I, I hear myself say or feel myself wanting to say, and, and uh, praise God, I'm learning to put a guard on my mouth even if I have to stop and turn it, what it's saying. But we want to represent the Lord because it is known. And this is how we know what's in our heart. And then we can just shake it off and keep on going. All right, I'm going to read in Philippians 3.9. This is my closing. I know, believe it or not, I'm not going to talk for an hour and a half. I could, but... I know, that's why I could say it. I figure if it gets dry, all I have to do is say something about the reality of who I am, and you all get a chuckle. Because I am here, seriously, to build character in you, okay? So someday in heaven, you're going to say, thank you, God, that Marie was in my life because she drove me nuts, but boy, she drove me to holiness because I had to repent a lot, and I had to learn how to be gracious. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Paul loved the Father. He loved Jesus, and he loved the Holy Spirit, and he longed to be with him and to walk with him and to, to be like him in every area of his life. He wanted to be like everyone. He wanted to be all things to all men so that in doing so he might be able to save some. His heart was for the lost because he had the heart of the Father. His heart was for the found because he loved the Father. He hated the enemy. He hated the enemy's ploys. And he wanted to see the kingdom of God come, heaven on earth. And he laid down his life daily to get that. My goal is to be like Paul. Because right now, I don't know who I'm like, but I have to lay down my life a hundred times a day. And then I still find myself falling short sometimes because I just... I just have bad habits in the familiar you go to, and you got to repent and go and repent and go. But God never says, he never says, I know, you did it again. He says, what are you talking about? Because he forgave me. He doesn't remember it anymore. I'm the only one that remembers. Silly me. All right. Paul said, my passion is to be consumed with him, with him, and not cling to my own righteousness. Well, thank God I'm not like my neighbor. Oh my goodness, I don't know if there's any hope for them left. That's not 
clinging to God's righteousness. That's clinging to my own. And wow, according to the Bible, my righteousness is like a dirty, filthy, gross rag. And we're not going to go into detail on that one. So my passion is to be consumed with him and not cling to my own righteousness based on keeping the written law. Oh, that religion. It's not the law that's saving me. My only righteousness will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The very righteousness that comes from God. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus and to experience, not know, not think about, not hear people give me their stories, but to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. Okay, footnote. Do you not know that the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you? We are not dead. We have been resurrected by the blood and power of Jesus Christ. He didn't stay dead, and either do we. And I'm not talking physically, someday I'm going to die and go to heaven and be alive again. I'm talking about now, because now he is renewing us day by day. He's taking us from glory to glory. He is renewing our mind as we submit ourselves to him. I will be with him in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Did, did he mean that he has to die on a cross and then be resurrected? No. He was saying, whatever it costs me to be like Jesus, I will do it. Whatever it costs, which means I have to lay down me, my wants, my desires, my opinion, all the things that I could have that isn't God so that I can hold on to what is God. Only then will I be able to experience completely. Completely. I love that. That's when I will experience completely oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of the dead. How do I get successful in my Christian walk? How do I go from glory to glory? How do I fall deeper in love with Jesus? How do I represent him well? By becoming so completely one with him that I am also one in the resurrection. I have been resurrected. The old is gone. I'm a new creation. Jesus died. The old was gone. He was resurrected again into new life with his spiritual body. Because although he was God, he was still man. So he has a heavenly body like we're going to get someday. But on this earth, we can walk in it. And that I love. And that is something that I continue to cry out for. And so I just thank you, Father. That revelation is a part of one of the spirits that you have. And Father, we, re we require revelation that comes from you as our vital need of necessity. Without me being able to really understand who you are and what you did for me, I can't really grab the fullness of it. Am I saved? Yeah. But I don't want to just be saved. I want to have you renewing me daily. I want to become more and more like you, Father. Our heart's desire in this church, in this house, for us, for our families, for our neighbors, for our friends, for their children and the generations to come, for this nation, for the world, oh God, that you would be seen in us and we would become more and more like you going day to day, closer and closer, falling deeper and more passionately in love with you, your heart and your ways 
so much that everything that we cared about before fades in comparison. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are working your heart and your mind and your desires in us as we are willing to lay down us so that you can be large in us. Thank you that you made us a promise that the work that you began in us, you will complete and you will keep completing it until the day of your return. So we give you all the honor and the praise and the glory for who you are. And we say thank you. Oh God, thank you for what you did for me. You know, life is never boring when you run with Jesus. It's not necessarily easy, but it's only not easy because we run our way sometimes. But it's amazing what he does and how he does. And we know that we have a covenant with him because he is the covenant lamb that was shed before the foundations of the earth. He had a plan before the plan because he already knew he needed it. But he loves us so much, he didn't start over. He just went to plan B. He had the cross already. Jesus already said, yep, I'll do it, God. He goes, okay, let's go make them. And never once did they say, yeah, but what about, you know, that person? Are you sure this is going to work? He is such a good God. And so we're going to celebrate communion this in the morning. And we, I, I've been doing this a lot, like daily, uh, with some friends on the phone at night. We pray together, and then we have communion. And our desire is to be <clears throat> never, to never be, calloused in our taking of the communion or oh it's the end we're done praying it's late let's get this done and yay hallelujah let's go on but we we're asking god for a revelation a fresh revelation it's like okay jesus the father goes and the 24 elders fall on their faces and throw their crowns and cry out holy is the lord and then the father goes and they fall on their face and they cry out, holy is the Lord, because every time they see another aspect of who the Father is, they're amazed and overtaken again. That's revelation. It's an ongoing. It's the ever-present manifestation, manifesting presence of the Lord. It's that constantly seeing more, understanding better, and it never stops. And I think, Lord, how can you take this incredible act, but it's basic, it's basic. It's not, that doesn't invalidate its power, but it's basic. He said, this is my body which was broken for you. Take and eat. Every time you think about me, remember me and you do it. Do it with a pure heart. Make sure we're good before you do it because you don't want to eat or drink damnation to yourself. But it's basic. It's a bread. And then he took the cup, and after he gave thanks, which blows my mind, he knew what that meant. And he was thanking God that he had the privilege to lay down his life for the people who hated him. But it's basic. He took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my blood, which has been poured out for you. Take and drink. It's basic, and yet it's never ending. The depth and the understanding of what we gain from it. And sometimes that understanding, it gets up here and it gets stuck. But when you have revelation, it goes into your spirit and it becomes life. 
And it's never dull and it's never basic anymore. And this is our desire, Father, as we get ready to take this communion. We do remember you. We remember the sacrifice, the willingness to lay down your life. No man could take my life, you said. I lay it down willingly. You let your life's blood be poured out so that we could be reconciled with the Father and one another. Thank you. Thank you for doing this for us. And as we get ready to take communion, Father, I ask that you would help each one of us examine ourselves, if there be anything in us, oh God, that we have pushed aside, that we have justified, that we don't, don't, aren't ready to give up yet. Please forgive us for that spirit that says, I want my way. Change us. Change our heart. We want your spirit to be so alive in us. So we will lay it down. And we will take up our cross and follow after you. Continue to, to minister to our heart, Holy Spirit. and have your full way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if everybody can come up, and we'll do the, we'll partake of the communion, but after you get it, I know I just did a little encouragement there, but I, w I would like you to hold on to it. I went to the, the Esther's weekend um, with Lou Engel that he did in October. And they did something so different during communion. And it really uh, ministered to my heart. So I want to do something that's going to be really unusual. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on who you are, I guess. But it was unusual to me. But it, it showed me something that I had missed. So I want to do that this morning. So if you'll come up and take communion, it's going to be a quiet moment because I don't have a song picked but you can like hum in your mind if you want <laughs> yes There's a, a little chorus that I grew up, <clears throat> excuse me, singing. I've been around for a while. I was, I was around before worship songs. They were called choruses back then. They were short, and they were pretty much to the point. And this one that I used to sing a lot in my home, my dad loved it. It goes like this. And if you've heard it, you can sing it. But we're going to do it a couple times. It goes, oh, 
How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I hear you know it. How I love you, Jesus. Communion is a, it's actually a romantic thing. When you commune with your spouse, there is love and companionship and intimacy. We don't call it communion, in quotes, because we don't, because we know that this is communion. But that's what it is. It's our beloved bridegroom and us loving one another, looking into one another's eyes, listening to each other speak. And loving them more because we just love when they tell you something and their voice goes up just a little bit. Oh, it's so cute. Just love when they say something to you and they kind of put their arm around you and, and give you a little squeeze because that's them. There is an intimacy that the Father has for us. And the intimacy that we have with him prevents a spirit of religion from getting a foothold. Because it is not an act of what is right and wrong. It's an act of love that says, I will do anything to please you because I love you more than my own life. And when we stood, those of us who have ever been married, we, made our, took, we took the vows, we spoke our vows to one another saying, I will love you when I'm sick. I will love you when you're sick. I will love you when we're poor. I will love you no matter what happens. Because I'm vowing, I'm giving you my all. And I'm saying no matter what happens, no matter how ugly it gets, I will never stop loving you because you make my heart skip a beat every time I think about you. And when you smile, it makes me jitter inside. And when you hold me, I feel so secure in your arms. And I know that you would never let anything happen to me if it was up to you. Because you love me that much. And we come to the Father. And we say, Daddy, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus, the bridegroom. We want to commune with him. We want to tell him how much we love him. And we want to hear him tell us how much he loves us. Oh, let the love relationship you have with us, that family love of a father and a child, that romantic, take my breath away, can't wait to see you again, love, with our beloved Jesus. We want the zeal of the Holy Spirit to be dwelling within us that teaches us how to love him better, how to worship him more, how to know that we are deeply and passionately loved by him. Holy Spirit, the way you reveal to us the heart of the Father and the love that's so intense for us. As we communion with you today, we say, oh, how we love you. And we are so glad that you loved us first. So on the night that Jesus died, he took the bread and he said thank you. And he broke it because it represented his broken body that was about to happen. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for loving us that much. Amen.
Jesus. When you said, take up our cross and follow you, it was to represent our death to self. A cross no, isn't anything but a decoration unless it's used for its main purpose, which is death. But when we die to ourself, then we can live for you in that resurrected state. And you are our example. You showed us how to do it. And you did it so amazingly because you had us in mind. And you never once held it against anybody that you had to do this. You never blamed us for it. You said, let me be the one to bring you back to life again and restore you back into the Father's family. You knew that there was blood necessary for the covenant, and so we thank you for this new covenant that your blood supplied for us. And every time we think of, take this cup, we will think of you, your sacrifice, as we anticipate our opportunities to offer back to you ours. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to sing that one more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask a blessing on everyone this week that they will find you where they never saw you before. They will hear you in ways they never heard you before. And their heart will leap and skip a beat when they remember who you are to them and what you've done. Thank you for your protection, <clears throat> for your constant companionship, <clears throat> and for being the wonderful God that you are. We love you. Amen.